All right. Praise God, everybody. Welcome to another segment, actually our 16th segment of Mantle Matters, our Faith and Finances webinar. And wow, we've got an interesting topic tonight, a very interesting topic tonight. Um, God downloaded into my spirit just today, just today. Um, I asked him for a word and woof, did he give me one. Um, the, the topic for tonight and whatever time of day it is that you may be uh, coming across this recording, um, if you're not with us live, this is our topic for tonight. And it may be the topic of your time and your season right now. What to do when your money gets funny. What to do when your money gets funny. Now, you know we've all been there. Uh, we've all had a time. Perhaps that time is your time right now. But one of the um, perplexing things in life is uh, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to do. But God has got an answer. He's got a prescription for everything that we face. There is nothing that we deal with in this life and on this earth that God does not have an answer to and for. He already knew what you were going to face before the foundations of the world were laid. And he also knew that he had already prepared an answer, a word of salvation, a method to the madness that you found yourself in that he would lead to your getting out of going through it or slaying it all together. Uh, there are some giants in our lives that uh, weren't meant for us to pray away, but for us to, in fact, pray and work through uh, to the point where we have victory over that thing, and that thing does not have victory over us. What to do when your money gets funny. My, my, my. Well, it's another segment of Mantle Matters, and you know in Mantle Matters we talk about our mantle, the, the, the issues, the, the um, uh, commodities of time, of talent, and of treasure. This is our ministry to the marketplace, this ministry courtesy of perspective matters. We know that the word mantle means that which is thrown around. It is an outer garment that is thrown around. And the one thing that we need to be cognizant of is that because our mantle contains the commodities of time, talent, and treasure. It must be mantled. They must be, they must be managed. They, those mantles must be cared for. Uh, you don't, th those clothes, that, that outer garment, that coat doesn't put it itself on you. You've got to put it on you. Okay? You, your clothes don't dress you in as much as you dress yourself in your clothes. All right? It's up to you to pick up your garment, put it on, and wear it. It is up to you to wear your mantle. All right? So it must be managed. You must be the one when your, your, your mantle, your garment uh, has been worn and soiled to do the cleaning, to do the sewing and the mending. You must be and work in cooperation with your mantle if that mantle is going to bless you as it was created to bless you. A, a covering was meant to cover you. It was meant to protect you from the elements of life. These mantles, these mantles that we wear, the mantle of time, of talent, and of treasure, you are to wear like an outer garment so that the world can see whose you are. It is your, 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 your uh, em, em, ambassador, em, ambassadorship on display before the world, that the world would see your mantle and know you are somebody, that you belong to a higher authority than anything or anyone on this earth. Like Joseph wore his coat of many colors, it showed off his father's love for him. It set him apart even from his brothers, which caused him some trouble now, didn't it? Well, the mantle that God has prepared for you, what he endeavors to do through the gifts that he's given you, this multicolor, technicolor garment, this outer garment, this mantle of time, talent, and treasure will set you apart. 
It literally will distinguish you as someone who is different than any, everybody else. It will distinguish you if you wear this thing and you wear it well. Well, to wear it well is to manage it well. And, you know, there's nothing that we throw around more purposely or less purposeful than our time, our talent, and our treasure. If we change, if you dare change how you use your mantle, you will participate in the change of your life that the Lord has been seeking to execute. He is not so much interested in changing your circumstances in as much as he is uh, all about the business of changing you. He just allows and uses circumstances to bring about our change. So our word is in mantle matters, waste not, want not. Manage your mantle, your time, your talent, and your treasure. Amen. So we know that in any language, time, talent, and treasure, they are commodities, and commodities are raw materials that build your life, and they must be managed. Time, talent, and treasure are indeed commodities. Commodities must be managed. So we must count our time, employ our talent, and gather our treasure. C-E-G, count, employ, and gather. And an overarching uh, issue is to deploy all that you are, the total sum of your Time, talent, and treasure must be deployed. You've been given time. You've been given talent in order to gather treasure that you just don't spend on yourself, but you're deployed into this world. You've been deployed at this time in history to be a seed of righteousness on this earth, to be salt and light. So you must agree to be deployed. That is why God has given you time. If you don't want to and have no intention of being deployed by him, your time just might get cut short. If you have no ambition to employ your talent for the Lord but to spend it on yourself, then you're, you might find your talent uh, not only being wasted but being lost. If you aren't already willing to gather your treasure for the benefit of the kingdom and its expansion and advance on this earth, well, you might find your treasure going in reverse, not uh, being gained or added to but altogether taken away. If for no other reason than just to get your attention to recognize that repentance is in order so that change and restoration can come about. Uh, we learned a little bit about that last week. Uh, no repentance, no restoration. Amen. All right. Well, as we begin this study on uh, what to do when your money gets funny, uh, we have to understand this overarching thing, that God uses our circumstances to bring about consequential change. God sends crises to send you back to the class you missed. It is, time, it is education time. It's time to learn through a crisis that can bring you out of your crisis and, in, and, and to the cross. Where at the cross, where we kneel and bow and find ourselves broken, we can be restored. We know this is true. People in church would rather look to miracles instead of management. God, you do this thing. You work this thing out. This is so beyond me. Well, management is never beyond you. God has given you abilities that we so rarely even execute. But he allows crises for us to build our faith because the only way we build our faith and our faith is built is through resistance training. Under the heavy weight and the oppressive circumstances of life, if we stick to the word, the word will work for you and build faith muscles that you would not have ordinarily been able to build because you've never had to exercise it. If you don't go through anything, guess what? You won't have anything, not where faith is concerned. So people in church, people who are traditionalists, people who are caught, de who are caught uh, dead in the midst of self-righteousness, will never be able to get and garner the true faith 
that is needed because they're not looking to someone that they can see, that they can't see. They're looking to who they can see. They're looking to help themselves. It is by their works that they declare their own righteousness. But ah, if the bottom gets pulled out, uh, they'll find that they're beyond their own abilities and in need of some help outside of the ability that they bring to help themselves. All right, And that is precisely where God wants us. You see, kingdom people know how to look to management instead of to miracles. Right Now, it's not that we don't believe in miracles, but when we manage as best we can in cooperation and collaboration with the Lord, and that's still not enough, we can depend upon the miracles of God to do what our own doing, even in collaboration with him, simply was not enough. So God will do the miraculous. Why? Because he can. He's able. He is able. All right. Management is the efficient, effective, timely use of someone else's goods with value added. It is our job to participate in what God is doing right here on earth, right here in your life. All right, management is us working with the one who is the owner. We are the steward, not the owner. All right, you see, if we develop and can develop our management abilities, and that is the ability that God gives us because he adds his super to our natural, we're able to do supernaturally what we cannot do in our own strength. And we're going to need it. Why? Because money runs from people who chase it. And that's what the world typically is doing. The world is running after money. And what is the effect, the impact of, of people, particularly kingdom people? Let me specify this. Kingdom people who chase after money. Guess what happens? Money runs to people who are good managers, whether they're uh, uh, saved and sanctified or not, money runs to people who are good managers. If the thing about the unsaved is they'll get to manage it only on this side of life. But those who are of Christ, those who are kingdom citizens, have the benefit, the double endowment of being able to manage what God gives right here, right now, and have the benefit of managing his kingdom throughout eternity. Remember, his, his is a kingdom that has no end. It's a for, forever kingdom, and you are going to be a forever manager. So we get the opportunity to practice managing um, earthly wealth so that we can learn how to manage true wealth. Because earthly wealth is merely a proxy that God uses in our management program. Uh, oftentimes, when, when I'm teaching people, for example, I, I would do seminars from time to time on, um, on investing, how, how to self-invest, um, uh, how to trade your own account. And one thing about that is before, particularly when using strategies like options, you can hurt yourself. If you don't know what you're doing, you can lose money quicker than, it, than the twinkling of an eye. You can lose a fortune if you don't know what you're doing. So the beautiful thing about learning how to operate using trading strategies is that you can open up an account <clears throat> online and actually play with play money to test those strategies, to train and get good at certain strategies. And then once you see yourself uh, making a fiat profit, a, a false profit, if you will, um, because you're not playing with real money, but you see your profit stacking up because your, your strategies are working and you're comfortable with them, then you can employ real money in your account and the results are for real. When you pull the trigger on a trade, you're either going to make money or you're going to lose money, and it's going to be real. And it can be real good or it can be real painful. But that typically depends on how well and how long you've been practicing with play money with a proxy dollar before you start playing with 
because you ain't playing when it's your money. Okay, uh, you're investing for real. All right, so money runs to people who are good managers, and God uses earthly wealth in our lives as a proxy to teach us good management skills principles, and abilities. So God will not give you what you pray for, but only what you can manage. That's a promise right out of heaven itself. He said that he would never test you beyond your ability. <laughs> and how is he going to test you first before he gives you a real account with real kingdom wealth? He's going to test you with the proxy monopoly money on this earth. That's, that's, that's what it is to him. That's all it is to him. It's just monopoly money to God. <laughs> that's not even the beginning of where his wealth begins, much less where it ends. So we need to get in our minds that uh, w when it comes down to managing money or any other resource on this earth, it pales in comparison to what the Lord truly wants to unload on you when he knows he can trust you with what really ain't much to him. It means everything to us. There are people who jump out of windows, put uh, gun barrels in their mouths, and blow their brains out over what amounts to God as monopoly money. Isn't that something? It ain't that deep, y'all, but it is. <laughs> but it is. Uh, we're called to become good kingdom economizers, to get the maximum out of the minimum. That is what God, through his blessing, allows us to participate in, economizing in his economy, how to take and get the maximum out of the minimum. When we come to Christ, we come typically broken. And lost, but he puts us back together and makes something out of our little. Even if you come to him in a deficit of yourself, a deficit of your former self, something's got to bring us to our knees. Something's got. We don't just lay down and come to the Lord of our own volition just because. Uh, no, we got to typically be broken first. And then when we come to him and we put our whole selves in his hand, on his altar, he, he shows us how to economize, how to get the maximum out of the minimum. You see, tithing, for example, has nothing to do with giving God money. It has everything to do with allowing God to help us learn kingdom management principles. Because if we don't know how to manage according to what his word says, then we're not going to be able to manage according to what his word says. When we want to move from monopoly money to something more fierce, if he can't trust you with what's not real, real wealth, do you really think he's going to put in your hands that which is an immeasurable amount of kingdom wealth? So it's important that we understand the principles so that we can become a principle in God's kingdom. You see, money is not ever, ever, ever your problem. Management is. Kingdom requirements expose our need for repentance. Ah, all right. Kingdom requirements. Kingdom requirements. Uh, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which Moses says, which I am commanding you today for your good. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 12 through 13. You see, the king and the kingdom has requirements for citizenship. That's why you've got to ignore all of this stuff that you tend to get, whether you're watching television, uh, listening to radio programs, or online. When you hear, just type amen, and, and tomorrow a blessing, an incalculable amount of money is going to just show up in your mailbox. It's just going to drop in your lap. Well, that's not how the Lord works. The king and the kingdom has requirements for its citizens and its citizenship, the evidence, your citizenship.
All right? So, to fear, number one is to fear the Lord your God. Two, to walk in all his ways. Three, to love him, which is identified by that obedience. And four, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. All right? Uh, and the fifth principle is keep his commandments and his statutes. Very, very important. There's always methods that God has to fix the problem that you have. Now, management is the overriding factor in achieving all of your good success. That's critical. Critical to know, critical to have. All right? Now, let's go on and stay in touch and in tune with what our topic for tonight is. All right, what to do when your money gets funny. What to do, what to do. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Psalms, chapter 37, verse 25. Psalm, chapter 37, verse 25. What to do when your money gets funny. This is what the psalmist King David said. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. I want you to think about that just one moment. Sometimes silence, sometimes silence can be a great thing. I'm going to shut up and just let that swirl around in your head for a moment. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. I want you to think on that for a moment. Just let that swirl around in your mind. All right, I'm back. I wonder what it is that God may have put on your mind Relative to this study, what to do when your money gets funny. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Now, there are several active words that we need to look at in this scripture to get a clue of what God is saying through the testimony and testifying of the psalmist, King David, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen who forsaken. I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Well, who's the righteous? Who is the righteous? How do I qualify to meet this definition? Has anybody ever accused you of being righteous? This word righteous in the Hebrew, uh, it, it's a word that means uh, just. It, it means just. Just. Lawful. Righteous. It, it, it's, it's a word that comes from a prime root, Sadiq. And this word in the Hebrew, this word which gives birth to the word being employed and used in this particular context, it means to be or to make right in, in a moral sense, in a, in a moral sense of the word. It means to be or to make right, to be right, to make right. Uh, it, it is oftentimes translated, this word Sadiq, um, in our English as the word cleanse, to clear self, uh, to be or do just, or justice, justify, to justify self, your, yourself, um, to be or turn to righteousness, or, or righteous, to be righteous, or to turn to uh, righteousness. All right. uh, it, it's an active word. It is an active word. All right. So the, the word, uh, the, the prime root of the word, Siddiq, is basically used as a, um, 
uh, as a verb. It, it, the, so the prime root that gives birth to the idea of righteousness is not just merely descriptive, but it is an action word, an activity to be or to make right. And this word for righteousness as it is used here, a derivative of siddiq, means just, just, lawful, righteous. It is a, uh, basically a noun. It, 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 it shows who you are based upon what you are doing or what's being done to you. Or in the case of God making you righteous, what you are participating in with him. Because it is his rising up that gets you up from your state of death and lying down. Uh, you got to lay down in this thing. This is something that you put on, and it makes you uh, – I've heard the term, and so have you, uh, the clothes make the man. Have you ever heard that? The clothes make the man. So the man who's found naked – well, I don't know what's made him. It just reveals God's handiwork. But when he puts on clothes, it, he puts on an identity. Now, it doesn't have to be authentic. It doesn't have to be him authentically. And that's the danger of just judging people on outward appearance. But this is an inner work that we put on, that we rest in what God gives us, an apparel of his making. That signifies us not in our identity, but in his. Because we struggle with our identity anyway. We don't know what self to put on from day to day. So to put on Christ Jesus is to put on his identity so that we don't have to worry about, okay, what do I put on today? I've got one wardrobe, the Lord says, that I want you to put on. Put on righteousness. Put me on. And you won't have to worry about how much other stuff is in your closet. If you're wearing me, I'll take care of all of the decisions in life for you and provide you with everything that you need. Put me on. Put me on. And to put me on, the Lord says, you got to put off everything else that was on you before because that was the inauthentic you. But if you wear me, I'll bring the real you out of my very self because your real self is hidden in Christ Jesus. All right? So this issue of righteousness, all right, also, and, and, and I need you to get this and understand this because we're going somewhere with this. Uh, there's another offshoot of the word uh, righteousness, this word tzaddik, which is the prime root. This next word is, uh, it, it's, also, it's spelled differently, pronounced kind of the same way in the Hebrew, tzaddik, and it means the right be it uh, naturally, morally, or legally right. All right. It means that you are correct. You are, are right in God's eyes. When he looks at you, he don't see wrong. He sees right. That's all he sees is right. From a natural point of view, from a moral point of view, from a legal descriptive point of view, when God looks at you through his vision, through his perspective, he doesn't see anything wrong, but he sees everything right about you. All right, it also has an abstract meaning and here's where it gets really kind of cute when we start looking at uh the etymology of the word for righteousness and what it really means to us and how that translates to your pocket and your pocketbook and your net worth statement and your bottom line. Here it is. This word also for Sadiq means the right, all right? But it also means in an abstract way, equity. Equity, we, when we, speaking of trading, speaking of investing, stocks are considered, considered equity. Equity means ownership uh, in the, the business world, the investment world. To have equity is to have an ownership interest in a business. So righteousness, then, is evidence that God has stock in you. Mm, I like that. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It, it, it evidences that God has an ownership interest in you, that you don't own yourself. You see, a corporation uh, uh, doesn't own itself, but it's owned by shareholders. It is 
a, uh, the evidence, if you will, of a third non-living person. When you create a corporation, you're creating a non-living person that has the rights to own stuff. The, 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 own, the, the corporation itself can own things. But the corporation can't be given life unless it's got stockholders, unless somebody has invested in it, unless somebody can stand up and say, I speak for the corporation. Mm, 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 mm. So when Jesus has an ownership interest in you, he goes before God the Father and saying, I'm speaking on behalf of, of your son or your daughter, Lord. I'm coming to you as a son and their older brother speaking on their behalf. Why? Because I've got an ownership interest in them. The word also figuratively also means prosperity. Now, ain't that good? Isn't that good? This word for tzaddik, which, which is a derivative and an offshoot of the word tzaddik, uh, meaning uh, to be or to make right, from which we get the whole concept of righteousness in the Hebrew, also is referring to our prosperity. That which is altogether, here's how it's translated, that which is altogether just or justice or right or righteous. All right? Uh, it, it comes out of this whole time. So you see how this affects you materially, monetarily. Righteousness has everything to do with God's ownership interest in you and his ownership interest in you also attaching his prosperity to it. Mm. All right. So I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous, the just, the ones who through God's perspective and his purview as sees there's nothing wrong with my son or my daughter. All I see when I look at him, when I look at her, all I do is see right. You see, what righteousness provides for you and provides for me is uh, to, to have a, a session with the one who has an ownership interest in us and saying there are, uh, there are rights that I have because I've been declared righteous by you. The king of kings, if there's, if there's something missing that's not evidencing his prosperity, and he sees you as righteous, then you have a right to go before the king and say, hey, what, what's, what's going on here? If you see me as right, judge my heart, judge my mind, and if there's anything that I'm out of order, bring it to my attention so that I can be made right again with you and get under the covering of you through repentance and forgiveness that I may be restored. That what has been lost to me when my money gets funny, I need the covering of the Lord. Because now I've got to begin to examine myself and see if I've been outside of the covering. Have I been outside of the covering? Do I need to get recovered? Because, Lord, you have equity in me. You own me. I am your corporation. And we're just, we're not experiencing the prosperity that I've been promised. So I know it's not you that's ever out of order. So what's out of order has got to begin and end with me. I've got to start taking responsibility because the word declares that in and of ourselves, no one is righteous. Romans 3, uh, 10 through 12 says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is what Paul writes and declares, and it is not his declaration, but God's that has come down through the annals of time and history out of the Old Testament into the New Testament because all Paul is doing is declaring what was written. Yeah, the word starts out with, as it is written. Who wrote it? God himself, through his prophets, it was declared, and through his apostle, it's being 
redeclare, reemphasize. None is righteous. No, not one. Don't get it twisted that you have any righteousness in and of yourself. Your righteousness that God sees you through has been purchased through his sacrifice. So, here's the issue. <clears throat> Those who are zealous for righteousness rather than for relationship miss righteousness because they missed the relationship. That's what happened with the, with, with the Pharisees. They were zealous for righteousness and tossed out the relationship when the relationship came. Here I am. I, the, the Messiah was on the scene, and they wanted to rub him out, not have relationship with him. But they were zealous for the righteousness that only could come through him. So the only good thing that can be said about the Pharisees <coughs> is tight but is right. They at least participated in the bringing about of his crucifixion so that all could be made righteous and have relationship by the one they rejected. So in a very twisted way, thank God for the Pharisees. They served a righteous purpose even in their zealousness for righteousness, which evidenced their unrighteousness. All right, the next word I want to look at in this text I have been old, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. I have not seen the righteous forsaken. All right, we know that whose right has been made right by the activity of the Lord on our behalf. But what about this forsaken thing? Though those righteous ones, David says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen those who are right and just in the Lord's eyes forsaken. This word for forsaken in the Hebrew, azab, it's a prime root, meaning that uh, everything that is associated with the word forsaken, in other words and other terms, in the Hebrew language, is an expression out of this word. It is the root that gives life to the whole idea of being left behind, being uh, um, uh, relinquished, being forsaken, being left. All right? This word for azab, it, this word azab is a prime root in the Hebrew, and it means to loosen. Listen, listen, listen now. To loosen. Now, uh, it, when, what to do when your money gets funny? What to do when your money gets loose? It gets loosed from you. Uh, you, you just got paid. Friday night, just got paid, and your, you, your money bag has holes in it. Come Monday morning, you back to broke. You run out of money before you run out of month. That is habitually your issue. And this is what the Lord says about those who are righteous. Right. I've never seen the righteous uh, loosened. Or relinquish. The, the word also means to be, to, to relinquish. Ah, here's another one. It, the word for forsaken also means permit, permit, permit. Now let's mess with this thing for a minute. Because this word for forsaken, it means to loosen. In other words, God says, I'm loosening you from me. We are no longer attached or connected. And the stuff that, that you were once attached to when you were attached to me, you ain't attached to anymore. You don't have my protection. You're not under my protection. So now your life has become permissive. There have been some permissive things that have permitted the taking or the loosening of your money. That's when money gets funny. Uh, th this word for forsaken also has the idea of to fail, to be allowed to fail, to forsake. To, uh, it means to leave, and specifically to leave destitute or to leave off. The word also is translated into our English refuse. So th this would be uh, David writing and saying, I have not seen the righteous loosed 
from the Lord. I've not seen the righteous relinquished by the Lord. I've not seen the righteous left destitute and left off or refused the favor of God. So the, the righteous, being righteous, in God's eyes, buys us favor with the king. And it also buys us the right to appeal for right treatment by our righteous king. And if your ticket is punched and you are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and walking in your calling... Walking in how you've called to be. The Lord says, be holy as I'm holy. Be righteous because I'm righteous. Well, we can't do any of that unless he abides in us and we abide in him. It is impossible for us to walk out righteousness, much less holiness on this earth, without the supernatural presence of the divine within us. All right? So this word for forsaken means that you won't be broken off or you can't be broken away from by the Lord. Not as long as you stay under the covering, under his mantle of righteousness. When you put that thing on, you're doing it of your own will to agree to walk in the righteousness that the blood of Jesus himself purchased for you. Right? Now, let's continue. At, uh, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. You've not seen them loosed from the Lord or from his blessings, David says, or his children begging for bread. This text is often taught out of context as though uh, the Lord is speaking about one and the same person or people. He's really not. And, and I just got a revelation of this word as I began to look at this text today. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. All right, that's one party. That's, this, that, that's a generation. Now here's what he also says. Or his children, his progeny, his descendants, those who come after him. He's not speaking of the same person. He's not speaking of the generation. He's speaking of one generation, a father and a mother, as being righteous and not forsaken, and then speaking in terms of or his or her children begging for bread. Most of us have been taught and taught wrongly that the righteous won't beg. If you're a part of of Christ, and you're made righteous, he's not going to put you in a begging situation. Well, the revelation I got from this today shows me different. It, it says, I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Okay. So, if you find yourself when your money gets funny, and you don't know how you're going to make it from day to day, or from month to month, how are you going to get from one paycheck to another paycheck? Look, the pay loan spot is not your savior. Do not, do not. That's just a failure of faith to go and, and, and sign up for that kind of interest when God has already said, I have an interest in you. I've got an ownership interest in you, and I declare you, you righteous and righteous because I do own you. Now walk like I own you and that you don't own yourself. Don't make financial decisions apart from the one who saves you. Oh, he'll, he'll get me out of it. Says who? He said he won't forsake you. He didn't say he would allow you to walk in your stupidity. And, and the fact that your children won't be begging for bread if you are among the righteous, but you might be begging for bread. Mm. There's a parable that the Lord used, and he used, remember, a parable is, uh, it, it could take the form of a riddle, if you will. That's why a lot of people, when Jesus taught, he taught using parables, because he didn't want to be easily understood, except by those who were really zealous for a relationship with him. Those are the ones who are going to be able to cozy up next to the Savior, get the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit infused teaching that would teach them the truth of what he veiled 
so that others who weren't as zealous after him as you are zealous after him, that they'd get the benefits that your zealousness for a relationship with Christ would get you. You got to press into this thing. So here's the deal. He said, he, he spoke a, about a parable using a name of, of, of a man that was a good friend of his, a loved one of his. And this was not the same man. The word Lazarus, the name Lazarus, was a very common name. It was as common as the name David or James or Michael is today. But he said that this Lazarus was a, was a beggar in front of a rich man's house. The, the rich man went unnamed. But the poor beggar had open sores that the dogs would come and lick. He would be in front of Lazarus' house every day begging for alms. Because Lazarus was a rich man, wore fine clothes. Uh, he feasted every day. Now, it was a rare occurrence for the people of this time to have meat on their table. It was only during feast time, festivals, only a couple of times, a few times a year, that they would have the benefit of being able to eat meat. But this rich brother, was, he was feasting every day. And poor Lazarus was broke, busted, and disgusted by our own terms. But he was begging. And the rich man died. And he found himself suffering. And then lo and behold, Lazarus died as well. And, found, and, and he was found in the bosom of Abraham, being comforted. For all that he went through in his earthly life, in the afterlife, brother, brother Lazarus had found some comfort. Whereas the rich man was made highly uncomfortable. To the point of beckoning Lazarus, Lord, uh, can you send him over here with just, uh, just a drop of water to put on my tongue? Still treating Lazarus as some poor stepchild, even in death. So this poor, uh, th th this poor man, formerly poor, was now certainly made rich in the comfort of the Lord in eternity. Whereas the rich man, who had incredible comfort on earth would now be made eternally uncomfortable. So, isn't it interesting how God turned the tables? That the beggar in the temporary sphere of earth became the rich man lying in the arms of Father Abraham, comforted by the presence of the Lord, not knowing any lack or pain any longer. But the one who was selfish about giving alms to the beggar found himself a beggar, begging the one beggar for just a drop of water. Who's to say that God isn't going to put you in a position where by any means necessary, your needs will be met, including begging God himself. Mm -hmm. See, this, this word for begging in the Hebrew, bakwash, is a prime root, and it means this. It means to search out, and check this out. It means not only to just to search out. It's not a casual search. It is a by any means possible kind of search. Look, I need to find me something. I need to find this this pearl. I need to find what I'm looking for. If I got to tear the house apart, I got to find this thing. It is a searching out by any means or any method necessary. Now, this word specifically, don't miss this. This word specifically means uh, especially uh, searching out in terms of worship or by prayer. In worship or, ooh, we, don't you miss this. This word for begging or beggar means to search out and specifically searching things out or begging through the means of worship or prayer. Mm, love etymology. Love being able to tear words apart because we get a richer meaning. All of a sudden now this word for begging and being a beggar isn't quite so negative. 
is not quite so negative. We get a different and a God-given perspective over a word that we've just kind of casually dismissed in our studies and teaching of the Word of God, perhaps all of our lives. You see, by implication, this word uh, bequash, meaning begging, means it, it means to strive after. It is also translated in our English as, get this now, ask. Ask, beg, beseech. Here, please, please, please give me what I want. Please, please give me what I need. It is a, a, a desperate plea for what you don't have. Uh, this word, ask, beg, beseech, desire, inquire. Uh, Lord, if you have this available, I need that. I, I, I need that, and I'm not going to let you go till you give it to me. Until I get what I desire, I'm going to inquire of every place and every person that has what I need that can, can connect my need to what they have, the source of getting my needs fulfilled. It also means, by begging now, get this, to get, in other words, your begging works. It has activity attached to it that gets you what you desire. Begging may be necessary. Mm -hmm. It means also to make inquisition. Lord, I'm out of health. Uh, can you fill my sickness with your healing? Can you fill, fill my empty pockets with what I, I, I can't wait to, to, uh, for the next paycheck, for the next pay period? Uh, what do I need for you to come through for me? It also means not only to make inquisition, but in fact to procure. Love that word. It's a compound word. Pro meaning for or forward and cure. You know what that means, C-U-R-E. To cure what is broken, to cure or fix and make well what is sick and diseased, to procure, to get what you need to make it to the next stop on your journey. Remember, this is always about a journey. God is trying to take you somewhere, and he's trying to take us somewhere through this study. Procure, to, to get what you need to get you to your ultimate destination while you're on your journey. The word means to make requests, to require, to seek for, and to seek after. Begging all of a sudden takes on a whole new context and meaning now, doesn't it? Now, remember this. The promises of the kingdom reveals your need for repentance. We brought up that topic last week. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 28. There are promises attached. When we are righteous by doing what God says to do, that God would put blessings in pursuit of you. Look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 28, verse 1 through 3. When you get an opportunity, look at that again and commit that verse, those verses into your spirit. Because he said that rather than having the problems of life, including bro being broke and brokenness, overwhelming you, that the blessings of the Lord would overtake you if you do what he says to do. And you do it with a joyful heart. There are promises connected to obedience. But when we compare the promises to what we have and we don't have what's been promised, we need to look within to see if we've been out of step with the steps that the Lord says, these are what I want you to take because taking these steps will bless you. I'll put blessings in pursuit of you. So when we find that we've fallen short, then we need to make ourselves right through repentance. And repentance means what? It means having a change of mind, changing your mind. Ah, what to do when your money gets funny? I have been young and now am old, yet have, I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Did not say that you wouldn't beg, but if you are in fact righteous and doing righteously, that God would not only bless you by answering for what you need, but he would put in pursuit of even the generations to come that which they need without them having to beg for it. Solomon didn't go begging because God was rewarding Solomon out of what David had done throughout his life. 
the, the sins of the fathers will follow the children to the, uh, uh, to the third generation. But the Lord says, don't, don't trip. Let your righteousness and your righteous living, that will follow your children for all time. Your children will not be begging for bread if you're not afraid to beg for God's grace, even and especially when it's not deserved. You see, here's the thing. The law establishes a standard. Uh, when we start talking about righteousness, and in order not to be forsaken and not to have your children begging for bread, when your money gets funny, remember that the law establishes a standard, a benchmark for righteousness. Uh, one, one thing uh, that we have to understand is that compared, comparatively speaking, there is righteousness, a standard and a benchmark. But grace is a lifestyle. It's a way of life that yields holiness. Uh, as we see through, if you've got your Bibles, again, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to tackle this subject real quick and get on and finish this topic. But in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, it reads, But God, I love it, I love it, I love it, but God, but God, but, but by no other means, not by any other source, you find yourself when your money gets funny, but God, mm -mm -mm. but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, that's where it all comes from, y'all, his love for you, because of the great love with, with which he loved, loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when you were broke, busted, and disgusted, he made us alive together with Christ by grace, by grace, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. Uh, he brings us out of the pit. He brings you out of your being broke, busted, and disgusted. He brings you up out of your lack and raised us up with him. That, that's the essence of relationship, that connection that he has with us and is maintained when we walk in his righteousness. Mm, mm, mm. And seated us with him. There's that emphasis on relationship again. All right. This isn't speaking of righteousness in the classic sense. This is speaking of grace. All right. Seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where the wealth is. The wealth beyond this monopoly money that we think when we have some, we got it going on. No. God looks at it for what it is. It's all monopoly money to him. It's play money. It is a proxy for real kingdom wealth. How well you handle what he allows you to handle on this earth will determine what you will handle both on this earth, on, in his kingdom, when his kingdom comes, as well as throughout all eternity. So he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, the promise of his kingdom and eternity, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So these are good works that we aren't only to do, but we are to be the good works. We are a product of his workmanship, that we would walk in the works that he already prepared for us, not that we can possibly prepare for ourselves. It's not about your work. It's about God's grace, which is a gift. Right? It's not of your doing. 
It is a gift. So check this out. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law that you cannot, could not, and would not, and will not be able to fulfill. You don't have it like that. I don't have it like that. You see, <clears throat> through the sacrifice of Jesus, grace allows you to walk in lockstep with the Lord, the living word. Whether you are broke in this world right now or you've got it going on in this world right now, the only way to really have it going on and go on into his kingdom and through eternity is to walk in lockstep with the Lord, the living word. That's the only way righteousness is received by us is to get it from him. He's the giver of the righteousness. If we try to get it for ourselves, you ain't going to get it. You're going to miss it because it's about relationship with him. It's a holy hookup. Receive the grace given by the only righteous Savior. Grace gives you more than a pass. You see, grace is uh, undeserved favor. Grace gives you more than just a pass. It gives you strength and fortifies your ability to live a lifestyle you would not ordinarily be able to in your own strength to live. That, that, that is the premier reason uh, why God gives us grace. It's for our own strengthening and fortification to live a life and a lifestyle that you couldn't possibly live in your own strength, on your own terms. You've got to live it according to the terms of the Lord. Again, for by grace you have been saved. Through faith, Ephesians 2.8. Grace, of course, and I need to emphasize it again, grace is undeserved favor. It is not a payback. It's not restitution. Grace is grace. It is undeserved. It's not something you can work for or even work toward. It's what you, you – otherwise it can't be called grace. Grace is undeserved. It's not a payment. It's not compensation. It's not a salary. It's grace. It's favor. Undeserved. The law, on the other hand, gives you what you deserve. That, that's why there is a distinguishing factor between tithes, which, which is caught up in the law, the Old Testament, the law, versus giving that is caught up in grace. Uh, tithes starts out as God telling us to recognize his ownership over all of it, 100% of everything that we have, by only giving him 10%. A tithe means the tenth. You can't change the definition. A tenth is a tenth. Anything less than that is not a tithe. Anything more than that is not a tithe. It's not a tithe either. When you go over and above that, that's, that's, that's part and parcel to grace. It's giving. Because giving isn't something that's mandated by a specific amount where you've got to whip out a calendar and say, all right, how much am I giving to God today? No, giving is the grace of God given back to him, saying, God, I'm thankful not for your law but for your grace that gives me the ability to walk over and above what righteousness requires, what the law requires. Ah, you are part and parcel to his grace. The law gives you what you deserve. How many of us want what we deserve? I don't. <laughs> give me grace. Don't give me the law. Remember what grace cost Christ and you. The law didn't cost him anything. But grace cost Christ everything. And it costs you too. You see, discipleship costs, and your anointing, huh, that costs even more, right? So it, it is about when your money gets funny, it's no laughing matter. What to do when your money gets funny? Get out your pens and papers. Here we go. I'm going to run this down, and we're done. What to do when your money gets funny? Number one, remember the promises. Remember the promises. It's about remembrance. Remembrance. Number one, remember the promises. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. 
that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. This ties in directly to our anchor text tonight that David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children, their descendants, their generations that came after them begging for bread. Now, their fathers may have had to beg, but their children didn't have to beg for the same thing because God remembered their fathers. He remembered the promise that he swore to the fathers so that the children were more blessed than the generations that came before them. You shall remember the Lord your God, and it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Now understand, he doesn't give you the wealth itself. He said, I give you the power to get it. I give you the power. He will empower you with ideas that create wealth because he will bless the ideas that create the power to get the money, the power to get the material, the power to capitalize the ideas that he's promised to birth out of you. It becomes his agenda that he himself will finance. You just have to stay in, number one, connected to him and collaborate and cooperate with him. In other words, obey. He gives you the power to get wealth. He didn't say he's giving you the wealth itself. It comes by way of the power and empowering that he puts inside of you. And typically that begins with an idea. The Word of God says again, under this same headed rem heading, remember the promises, remembrance, but seek first the kingdom of God and his what? <laughs> his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you, Matthew six thirty three. So remember the promises. And the promises will always be begotten in the righteousness that is not yours, but his. We're merely called to walk in the righteousness of God, which you can't do in your own strength. And guess what? You're not going to get any wealth worth more than a generation on your own either. Not if you're a kingdom citizen. God is going to work with his children, his sons and his daughters differently than he allows the children of this world to get away with. Because in the end, they're not getting away with anything. There's a judgment that awaits them. And there is an exaltation. Promotion awaits you. If you get caught up and stay caught up in the righteousness of the Lord. Number two, second prescription. What do you do when your money gets funny? Number two, walk in, walk by, walk by faith in the promises. You've got to remember the promises. You've got to feel find the promises in the word of God. You've got to become a student. You've got to uncover, unearth the promises. Stay connected to a ministry and ministers who are ministering through the promises. This is what the Lord of God says, and this is what he says is required so that you will get what he says you'll get. That's the kind of teaching that's needed today. Walk by faith in the promises. This means obedience, plain and simple. Obedience, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What evidence, what evidence is your righteousness before God so that you won't be found forsaken and your children won't, and the generations that precede you won't find themselves begging for bread? The righteous shall live by faith, not by anything else. By faith, you've got to evidence your righteousness through your faith by living and walking in the faith that God gives you. Number three, expect what has been promised. You've got to remember the promises. You've got to walk by faith in the promises. And number three, 
You've got to expect what has been promised. Uh, we began with remembrance, obedience. Now we're dealing with expectation. Expectation. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Uh, ask. <laughs> Beg if you have to. <laughs> ask and it will be given to you. That is an affirmative. That is a declaration from the lips of the Lord himself. Ask, beg me, beg my Father, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Uh, you've got to have expectation. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. First Thessalonians 5, 24. So he, God, Christ himself who calls you, he's faithful. He will surely do it. Do what? What he's promised. All that he's promised, he's faithful. He'll do it. He would, so your expectation should be assured. No matter how empty your pocket is, make sure your heart and your mind are full of the expectation and the hope of what's been promised. And you'll start to see the tables be turned right side up in your financial life. What to do when your money gets funny. Number four, execute the promises. Ah, we're talking about uh, kingdom citizens must become kingdom managers. Managers are not executives unless they learn how to execute. How can you call yourself an executive and you can't execute your way out of a paper bag? God is going to teach you through lessons in lack how to get to the place of abundance, the promised land, the promised places that he has promised you. They must be executed by you. Don't just, it's not just up to the Lord. He gives you the power to get wealth. You're participating in this thing. The emptying of your wallet, I bet that was all you. But the filling of your wallet, the filling of you materially and financially is going to have to be executed through cooperation with the owner of all things. You've got to work in cahoots with Christ. Execute the promise, the promises. So we've talked about remembrance, obedience, expectation. Now we're dealing with execution. Execute. You've got to execute the word. Here's what the word of God says. The psalmist says this in Psalms 103.20. And this is just a baseline to begin a conversation about execution. Bless the Lord, O you his angels. Now, don't get hung up on angels because you don't have no wings. Uh, we're not quite talking about that kind of angel necessarily. Because angel just means uh, messenger. And all True children of God are messengers of the word, of the Lord. We're ambassadors of Christ. I've never seen an ambassador not having a word, a testimony, something to say about his country and his culture. He's been sent to a foreign country to represent the country and culture from out of which he's been sent. You too have been sent into this world to proclaim the kingdom and the king and his culture. Bless the Lord, O oh, you his angels, his messengers, his sent ones. You mighty ones who do his word. Do his word. You mighty ones who do his word. How do we show ourselves mighty? By doing what he says. Ah, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. That's how we execute. And that's just the beginning of all that's in his word about cooperating with him in executing his word. Because his word doesn't fail. But we've got to participate in the execution. Do his word, obeying the voice of his his word. The Lord, if you avail yourself to him, even in your broke state, I don't care how broke, busted, and disgusted you are, give God your ear as well as your heart and your mind. Be teachable, and he will implant into you, download into you ideas that give you the power to get what you need. And we're talking specifically in terms of worldly wealth. 
But that applies across the board, holistically in your life. You've got to execute the word. Execute the promises. It's about execution. Lastly, and even I would dare say most importantly, when your money gets funny, it's no laughing matter. But remember to laugh along the way anyway. This is about elation. Remembrance, obedience, expectation, execution, and finally, elation. Praise, praise. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Mm, mm, mm. For this day, the day that fi people find their, their baskets empty, their, their bank accounts empty, their money spent, them waiting in grief for the next payday that isn't coming fast enough, the word of the Lord says, go your way and eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our God. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What is he saying? Here, he, he's speaking out of the word to Nehemiah and to encourage Nehemiah and Ezra to encourage the people. Tell them to go their way. They had gathered together after having been set free from Babylon. This remnant is just a remnant, not every, not every Hebrew, but just a remnant of Hebrews returned back to Israel and back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They were there on assignment, not to build their own houses, and they were castigated in the word from the prophet Haggai, right during this same time period, because they were lax to build the temple of the Lord. Instead, they put their own houses and the building of their own fortunes first. And the Lord spanked them because of it. And this is what he said. As they obeyed and the temple was built and rebuilt and the walls were rebuilt, in their hearing the word of God, they all stood up for the reading of the word. And then at the conclusion, Ezra sent them away and he said, then he said to them, go your way. Those who have, right, right, those who have, those who aren't broke, busted, and disgusted, you, you go ahead and eat the fat and drink sweet wine, but don't leave the poor out. Meet the need of the needy so we can all feast together. Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine. But don't forget, remember, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. So for those of us who have nothing ready, nothing prepared, be in expectation of the promise of the Lord that the Lord himself will put you on the mind of someone who has what you need. And through them, because of the prompting and the remembrance of you that the Lord put on their mind, your need is going to get met. There's your, there's your elation right now. Laugh along the way. Uh, yeah, I'm broke. Yeah, I can't wait to the next pay period. Uh, yeah, I've got bill collectors called. Whatever the case is, Remember, when your money gets funny and it becomes no laughing matter, to remember to laugh along the way anyway because the Lord is going to bring this to an affirmative conclusion. Jeremiah 29, 11 states it plainly. I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you. And where are those plans going to take you? They're not to harm you, but they're to prosper you. He was speaking, Jeremiah uh, had the word of the Lord speaking to a people on their way to exile for 70 years. They were being committed into the hands of the Lord and from the hands of the Lord into the hands of their enemy for a 70 year sentence. And the Lord was telling them, ah, 
don't you doubt it for a minute. I've got great plans for you. This is not going to be for your for evil, but it's going to be for your good. You're going to emerge from this thing to give you a hope and a future. So what, however you find yourself as you're listening to this word tonight, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to find joy because you've already found favor with the Lord. If you've committed yourself to repentance and to dwelling and abiding with the Lord, no matter how bad things may have gotten, don't forsake the Lord. Because believe it or not, no matter how bad it is, he's not forsaken you. When it looks like things are falling apart, things might just be falling into place. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What to do when your money gets funny? <laughs> Just laugh because God's got a plan. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Ah, Every Tuesday night, uh, meet us here uh, for Mantle Matters, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central, 7 Pacific Time. And then join us not only for Mantle Matters, our finance and faith webinar, but every Wednesday morning, bright and early, 6 a.m. Eastern Time, 6 Pacific Time, two prayer calls, uh, Perspective Matters prayer call, and we got a lot to pray about tomorrow, given the state of our nation. We're going to pray in God's purposes and promises concerning what is lacking in our nation, a vacuum of leadership. Oh, yes, 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 God is on the case Trust them, y'all. And then every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central, 6 Pacific Time, we've got Perspective Matters Online Bible Study. Yes, 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 join us indeed. This is Mantle Matters Ministries. My name is Pastor Philip Lowe. You can catch up to us on perspectivematters.org, our website that we trust and pray will minister to your every, every need that you have. You can catch up to us at uh, here in Las Vegas at P.O. Box 753962, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89136, or give us a call at 877-281-1580. My name is Pastor Philip Lowe. Let's go before the Lord and pray out. Father God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word, O oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're doing a new thing, even as it may look like we are broke, busted, and disgusted. We can throw the disgusted out because your riches are on the way. Father, your, your grace is already with us. You've lavished your grace upon us, Lord God, through this rich teaching. O oh God, I pray that we will walk accordingly with the expectation and the hope that this is going to come out all right, that what we lack, you will provide. Let us not be afraid, and we're not afraid to beg, to ask, Lord God, to, to, uh, uh, to seek and to knock, because you will indeed answer. We give you praise. We give you glory. No matter how we were found at the beginning of this study tonight, Lord God, we emerge out of here, Lord God, raised up because you've done the raising of our heads from our bent and broken position, Lord God, to not only be helpful, hopeful, but to be expectant that you're going to turn our financial tables, our financial world right side up from being upside down. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, and amen. Go in peace. Don't go to pieces. God bless you.